Last year, for my Christmas special, I did a solo run of Fire Emblem 3 Book 1 with only Cain and Abel, aka the Christmas Cavaliers. I thought it was appropriately festive, and if you're interested in watching the run, it is linked below. However, the reason that I bring it up is that one of the recurring jokes throughout the run was my belief in Red Cav supremacy. This was mostly just an excuse to give the favoritism to Cain instead of Abel, after all someone needed to get all of the resources for me to power through, but it brings up the question, which is better, the Red Cavalier or the Green one? The obvious answer is that it is subjective and up to your opinion. There's nothing inherently better about being a red cav or a green cav. However, that is the coward's answer, and we here at the Danny Doyle YouTube channel refuse to accept cowardice. So instead, we are going to approach this question with scientific rigor and prove definitively once and for all whether red cav supremacy is correct or whether I was misled and misguided. So, to that end, we will be going through every game in the series, looking at the Cain and Abel archetypes, determining which one is better, and categorizing them as naughty and nice. At the end of the day, we will tally up the total, and whichever half has more good units will be crowned the winner, and therefore we will determine whether Red Cav Supremacy or Green Cav Supremacy is the ethically correct choice. If we go back to the origins of the series, the first two Christmas Cavaliers were Cain and Abel, named after a pair of brothers from the Bible who were known for getting along very, very well. Both join as unpromoted Cavaliers in Chapter 1 with bases that are quite respectable. They're actually pretty hilariously close to Jagan's bases. Considering the fact that they have functional growth rates while he does not, they are pretty good targets for investment, although arguably Harden overshadows both of them when he shows up, and the first Nightcrest is pretty late, so they're going to be unpromoted for a while. Still, this is Fire Emblem and you can never have too many Cavaliers, so I would say that both of them make pretty decent units, but which one is better? If we look at their defensive profiles side by side, they share the same max HP, defense, and resistance stats, although the resistance one is not notable because every unit in the game shares the same resistance stat of zero, with the exception of Goto. Looking at their offenses, Kane has one extra point of strength, whereas Abel has one extra point of speed. But if we look at their growth rates, it is the inverse, with Abel having a higher strength growth and Kane having a higher speed growth. At the end of the day, these differences are pretty minimal, being only one point in base stats and 10% in growth rates, but it is kind of interesting how they gave the growths and bases sort of flip-flopped with each other to really try to even out these Cavaliers. It is worth noting that due to the tiered nature of speed, they are virtually identical when it comes down to which enemies they will double, so the speed lead isn't a big deal, but it's also virtually identical which enemies they will one round, so the strength lead isn't a big deal. These two units are very, very close to each other. The only other differences is Kane has an extra point of luck, and Abel has an extra point in weapon level, as well as two points in skill. The luck and skill are such unimpactful stats in Fire Emblem 1 that we can basically discard them, but the one point in weapon level is unfortunately somewhat significant. While it doesn't change what weapons Abel is able to use at base, as there are no swords or lances at 6 weapon level, it does make it faster for him to reach the coveted 7 weapon level, and 7 is what is needed for the Worm Slayer and the Killing Edge. Because Abel has an incredibly high weapon level growth at 70%, he's fairly likely to be able to use these weapons after just a single level, making him, unfortunately, better than Cain. It hurts to say this because it is just the minorest of differences, but he is closer to Killing Edge, which you get in Chapter 3, than Cain is, and he has 10% more weapon level growth, so... Yeah, unfortunately we're off to a bad start for Team Red Cavalier. Now the next game in the series is Fire Emblem Gaiden, and this game actually does not have a pair of units I would refer to as a Cain and Abel archetype. While it is true that Luka is a red armor, in Gaiden Forsyth was a purple armor, only turning green retroactively in Shadows of Valentia. And while I have heard some people refer to Mei and Bowie as the Christmas mages, I don't understand this logic because they're not red and green coded, it's just two mages who join side by side with each other. That doesn't make them Cain and Abel. Like, the important part of Christmas Cavalier is Christmas, not Cavalier. As such, Gaiden has clearly joined the war on Christmas. Yet another cringe Gaiden moment. More reason not to play Fire Emblem 2. Let's just move straight on to Fire Emblem 3, Mystery of the Emblem. Book 1 is a remake of Fire Emblem 1, and while there are things that have changed, unfortunately the Christmas Cavaliers are not one of them. 
their base stats and growth rates remain identical, and if anything, the importance of the Killing Edge is even more emphasized as there are indoor maps where they are stuck dismounted and using swords. I guess theoretically if I wanted to copium, I would say that you can't use swords while mounted, so the Worm Slayer and Killing Edge are not important for outdoor maps, but this is mostly just my red cap copium. It turns out I was incorrect in last year's Christmas special. I should have focused on Abel. Red Cap Supremacy, I will believe in you, I promise. Let's move on to book two and see if I can find a reason to say that Kane is better. And it turns out I actually kind of can. You see, book two chooses to split the Christmas Cavaliers from each other, with Kane joining significantly earlier than Abel. He is a level 9 Cavalier who joins you at the beginning of chapter 8, with pretty respectable stats for that time. 10 strength and 9 speed is quite good in a game where the caps are 20. You also have some Star Spheres available to boost his growth rates, because 30% attack and 60% speed are okay, but they're not phenomenal. You can get him to the point where he is nearly guaranteed to proc important stats due to the fact that the Star Spears each give plus 50% in their specific growth rates. This, in combination with the fact that he gets decent stat gains from promotion, make him an alright unit. He still suffers from the fact that he needs to dismount in indoor maps and the end game is almost entirely indoor maps, so he's not going to stomp over the entire game, but he's a decent contributor to your army and is someone who is well worth deploying on outdoor maps. The same cannot be said of Abel, who joins significantly later as a level 1 paladin, who you must talk to at the end of chapter 15 with either Marth or Est. This is a 7 chapter difference, but it might as well be an 8 chapter difference considering how close he is to the throne when you recruit him. However, the trade-off that you get for significantly less availability and time spent training with Star Spears is 3 more strength, 4 more skill, 6 more speed, 1 more luck, 3 more weapon level, 4 more defense, and 6 more resistance, but that 6 resistance comes purely from Paladin. If you promote Kane, he will get plus 6 resistance on promotion, so it's not like Abel has a higher base, it's just the fact that he is in the Paladin class that gives him the resistance. Honestly, if you've even been moderately conscious of what Star Spheres you put on Kane, he probably has better stats than Abel by the time Abel joins, and that is damning in comparison. I do like that they separated the Christmas Cavaliers from each other, but it does kind of just make Kane blow Abel out of the water. And honestly, I couldn't be happier because this is a slam dunk win for Red Cab Supremacy. Let's fucking go! Let's fucking go! Let's fucking go! My personal biases aside, Abel is still fairly useful as a filler paladin on outdoor maps after he joins. It is unfortunate that the very next map you have is an indoor one where he will be significantly hampered, but if you have a spare deployment slot and the map is outdoor, there's no reason not to use him. He's still got decent stats for the join time. It's important to remember that there is a 20 cap in this game, so 13 attack, 14 defense, and 15 speed are very good. His biggest issue is he's not around for a lot of the outdoor maps, and if you train people with the various star shards, they will probably be ahead of him by the time that he joins. Finally moving on from Arcanea, we can talk about Fire Emblem Force Christmas Cavaliers Alec and Noish. These are typically thought of as fairly mediocre units, although they do have their cult followings. Both join in the prologue, and thus have perfect availability for Generation 1, and both are on a horse, which is honestly the most important trait a unit can have in FE4, so we're off to a very good start. Unfortunately, that's kind of where I stop saying good things about them. Despite being able to keep up with Sigurd, their combat pales in comparison to his, and is honestly pretty far behind the rest of the army as well. I won't say they're bad, but they're definitely fairly middling. They're kind of just doing chip damage or secondary jobs, rather than your primary combat carries. I'll start with Alec, because his problems are much more straightforward than Noish's. He just kind of has stinky stats and stinky growths. His base 9 strength and 7 defense pale in comparison to most of the rest of your army, and his 30% growth rates in each of them means that he won't be catching up anytime soon. In fact, he generally gains stats slower than people who start with better bases. The only unit who is statistically similar to him is Finn, who actually has the same base strength and defense as well as matching growths. However, Finn has the ultra-powerful miracle skill going for him, and a higher lance rank which gives him access to the Brave Lance later on in the game. In comparison, Alec has swords, which are a pretty good weapon type, but are also more highly contested, as there are many strong units who can use swords, but fewer who can use lances. 
Alex's only two skills are Pursuit and Nihil. Pursuit is definitely very good. It is arguably the best skill in Fire Emblem 4, and it is the one required for doubling. However, Alex still isn't dealing that much damage when he's doubling, and often a unit who can't double will deal more damage in one attack than Alec does in two. Nihil, on the other hand, is an extremely niche skill. It prevents critical hits and offensive skill procs from the enemy, however, both of these are exceptionally rare. You need a special skill in order to get a critical hit, and most enemies don't have that skill or any other offensive skill. It is useful in a few situations, in particular for baiting Ira and Jamka, since he can do so knowing that he won't be crit or Astrid, and it prevents him from taking effective damage from the Rider's Bane equivalents, because in Fire Emblem 4, effective damage is just an automatic critical hit. Therefore, his crit prevention also prevents effective damage. But there aren't that many horse effective weapons in Fire Emblem 4, and Alex's defensive profile is so bad that you probably don't want to frontline with him even if he's not taking the effective damage. I have heard the argument that you can give him the magic swords and magic rings to make him into a mounted mage, and have him attack enemies on res since res is often significantly lower than defense. However, bear in mind that the magic ring only gives plus 5 magic, and Alex's max magic is 0, with a 5% growth rate, so you're using a mage who has 5 magic for the entire game. Enemy res is definitely lower than defense, but it's not so much lower that I want to use a unit whose primary offensive stat is 5 until he promotes, at which point it becomes 10. Especially in a game like FE4 where stat creep is through the roof. Alec is fine for doing filler combat in the early game, since he has weapon triangle over all of the axe users, but even then he consistently fails to hit KO thresholds, and as a result, he's not securing kills and therefore not gaining experience, causing him to fall behind. By the time there's no more axe people for him to leverage weapon triangle over, his combat becomes poor enough that I often don't even bother resetting over his death. Noish's problems are slightly more complicated. He actually has high enough strength to deal a decent amount of damage, however without the pursuit skill he will never double. Combine this with the stat inflated enemies of FE4 and it is incredibly difficult for Noish to kill full HP enemies, meaning you either have to set up kills for him or use him to set up kills on other people. Typically I think of the Christmas calves of one being found and one being strong, and this feels like the origin of that dichotomy. Alec can double, but he hits like a limp noodle. Noish hits regular, but he can't double. Fortunately for the Red Calf propaganda team, Noish has a few other tricks up his sleeve. The first is that you can give him the Pursuit Ring, and this isn't a highly competed over resource. Despite the fact that Pursuit is an extremely important skill, many Generation 1 units start out with it inherently or are granted it upon promotion. As a result, there aren't too many people who want the ring. The biggest candidates are Ethlyn, Finn, and Quan, and they all leave at the end of Chapter 3. Now, you may still want to give the ring to Ethlyn at this point so she can pass it down to her son, however, if you are not doing that, Noish is really the only unit in your army who actively wants the ring. That being said, his speed growth and speed base are, well, shaky would be putting it lightly. Even with Pursuit, there are a large number of enemies Noish will struggle to double. And as such, it is arguably more valuable to lose three chapters of the Pursuit Ring than to give it to him. That being said, you can still use him for filler chip combat, and I think he's better at that role than Alec, for two reasons. The first is that if you need him to kill a weakened enemy, he can usually do so in one hit and doesn't have to eat a counter. Whereas if you're using Alec for the same thing, he usually needs to double to do so unless the enemy is extremely weak. If he's doubling, that means he's facing a counter, and if he's facing a counter, he's getting closer to death, either resulting in him dying and me being happy, or him needing to consume the term of one of our healers. It's not an incredibly huge deal, but it is undeniably a small point in Noish's favor. However, the other secret sauce that Noish offers is he has critical which means that sometimes he'll score a critical hit, and the critical hits in Fire Emblem 4 are very strong. Instead of tripling your display damage, it doubles your attack, and usually this results in a significantly higher increase in damage than tripling your display damage, since the second instance of your attack doesn't factor in the enemy's defense. Essentially, think of it like you're attacking twice, but one of them casts Luna and causes your enemy to have zero defense. Noish also has the Akos skill, which is a chance-based activation for a second round of combat, meaning that he has another way to potentially deal more damage than the forecast says. Neither of these are super reliable, but the fact that Noish does have a proc chance to kill where Alec does not, I think cements him as the winner. I do want to briefly touch upon the options they offer as fathers, as they're interesting, although I think both of them are probably best served as bachelors. 
Alec has Nihil and he can pass it down to anyone you don't want to be crit or take effective damage, which includes Fee, the Pegasus Knight, who you can make immune from arrows. This is pretty cool since the game doesn't have any sort of Delphi shield. Unfortunately, he can never sire the other flyer, Altena, but she's kind of bad anyway, so it doesn't super matter. Other than that, Alec does offer Pursuit for any of the kids who don't get it inherently, but many of the kids get Pursuit inherently, and the ones who don't probably prefer other fathers for various reasons unrelated to Alec. Noish, on the other hand, can pass down Critical and a Cost, both of which are proc skills that you could give to any units who you are interested in supplementing the chance-based kill power of. I don't think he makes for a particularly strong father, but he can be a very fun one, especially if combined with Ira, since she also brings some proc-based kills to the table. On the topic of Generation 2, Salif's army does not have a pair of red and green coded units, therefore I think it is safe to skip that and move on to Fire Emblem 5. I've heard some people refer to Orson and Halvin as the Christmas Axe Bros, but they're not red and green coded, they're orange and red. No, if you want to look at a pair of characters who have a red and green color scheme, it's Kane and Alba, and I don't really have any thoughts about these two. They are incredibly underwhelming Lance Cavaliers. Kane with his green collar has one more strength, and Alba with his red collar has two more speed. Kane also has 15% higher strength growth in comparison to Alba's 15% higher speed growth, and otherwise they are basically the same unit, like underwhelming, underleveled, late joiner, I'm gonna go ahead and say that Alba is better because speed is a better stat than strength, um, but they both kind of suck. This is a minor victory for the Red Cavs, but we take all the victories we can get. I'm trying to stack the deck as much as I can because GBA is going to be rough on my Red Boys. Starting with FE6, where the general rule of thumb is that if Alan is able to double, use Alan, but if Alan is not able to double, use Lance. Usually, Alan is not able to double. I hate to say it, but doubling thresholds are incredibly difficult to meet in FE6, and Alan just usually doesn't keep up with Lance in this regard. As a result, I support them with each other, and then I kill Alan off on the Western Isle so that Lance can soar free. I'm sorry, buddy. I've betrayed the Red Cavalier pride. But I'm not sorry to Kent, the worst Red Cavalier in existence. Kent and Sane are both already in a very rough position. As without Lin mode, they are both pretty underleveled for their join time. In any other game, this wouldn't be a huge problem, as you could train them up to be a filler cavalier and they could just be paladin number 2. However, in Fire Emblem 7, enemy quality is so low that the experience they give is minimal enough that it's pretty difficult to train even one underleveled unit, let alone two who show up at the same time. And the payoff of being cavalier number 2 is at its lowest value yet, since deployment slots are so tight in Hector hard mode that you usually don't have room for a second cavalier. And if you do, that's probably going to be Lowen because he has the highest level out of all of them, and therefore the best stats. However, even if you were to play Lin mode or otherwise get the three Cavaliers to the same level as each other, Kent would easily be the worst of the trio, because his specialty is speed. Now, it may seem odd that I consider that a bad thing since I rewarded Lance for having good speed, but Fire Emblem 7 enemies are slow as shit. As a result, Sane and Lowen are able to double roughly three quarters of all enemies. This means that Lowen's bulk and Sane's higher strength are incredibly valuable, whereas Kent is kind of just a middling unit. I mean, middling feels generous. Kent is pretty bad. Kent might be the worst Christmas Cavalier in GBA, although Ford definitely gives him a run for his money. Kyle and Ford join in Chapter 5X, which is a separate chapter where you only have control of them, Ephraim, and Orson, the temporary unit. This means that they have a source of experience relatively to themselves, and 5x often serves as a cavalier training chapter. In my opinion, this makes them better candidates for Paladin number 2 than Franz, as Franz is competing for experience with units like Vanessa and Archer, who might want it more than him. The only competition for our Christmas Cavaliers is each other, and if we weigh them against each other, Ford falls short in basically every area. So unfortunately, this is another certified green cavalier win. I am, uh, I'm pretty desperate right now. Can we move to somewhere where Red Cavaliers are significantly better than green ones? Like Tellius? As a bonus, this gives me an opportunity to dunk on Oscar, a unit I have an unjustifiable hate boner for. 
So, for the first time since FE3, we get a mix-up on the Christmas Cavaliers, with Oscar the Green Cav joining in Chapter 1 as a member of the Grail Mercenaries, but Kieran, the Red Cavalier, not joining until Chapter 11, since you free him from jail in Chapter 10. Statistically, if they're at the same level, all four of the unpromoted Cavs should have virtually the same stats, but there are still a couple of things that distinguish Oscar and Kieran from each other. The most notable thing in Oscar's corner is that he has almost perfect availability, missing only chapter 3 and 4. This means he can contribute in the early game, and he should get credit for those contributions. However, the early game is mostly dominated by Titania. She is both the fastest and safest way to clear maps, and relying on her allows you to get bundles of bonus experience who you can sink into other units. As a result, even with the extended availability, Oscar's contributions are somewhat negligible. In fact, his early join time mostly serves as a detriment, since you're going to have to train him during those chapters or else feed him bonus experience in order to have him keep up with Kieran, who joins with much better bases and a better weapon type in Axes. The fact that Kieran is significantly more competent at base and doesn't need any bonus experience to do his job, I think cements him as the winner. Not just of the Christmas Cavaliers, but I genuinely think he's the best unpromoted Cavalier in the game. I wish I could say that about his FE10 iteration, but it's kind of pathetic. He has the unfortunate task of being stuck in Alincia's army, which means he has crap availability and when he finally joins a real army, he will be underleveled. He is actually so hilariously outclassed by Archer that one of my friends mentioned she doesn't actually think Oscar and Kieran are the Christmas Cavaliers, but Oscar and Titania are, since both Oscar and Titania join as paladins, only four levels apart from each other, and Titania has red hair. Personally, I think this is a bit of a stretch, but I was grasping as many straws as I could to make the Red Cavaliers come on top, and so I asked my community if they consider Titania and Oscar to be the Radiant Dawn Christmas Cavaliers, and unfortunately they agree with me. Kieran and Oscar have the pre-established relationship, and they sort of are opposites with each other, so in addition to the red and green armor, they have red and green personalities. This does unfortunately mean that I have to say Oscar is better than Kieran, which is very tragic, but it's only in Radiant Dawn. Trust me, Kieran is still significantly better in Path of Radiance. Unfortunately, the bad news for the Red Cavaliers just continues, because when we enter FE11 Shadow Dragon, the most important part of the Cavalier's kit is their Lance rank, and Kane has E rank lances as opposed to Abel's D rank. This means that Abel is able to use the Javelin at base and, most crucially, closer to Horse Slayer, and Forged Horse Slayers are a big part of any Lance user's combat. While Kane's Lance rank is salvageable if you want to use him because you're a true believer, unfortunately Abel is just better because, you know, you don't have to salvage his Lance rank. He has D and you're gonna get C on time. It's also worth noting that if you don't feel like using either of these units long term, Abel will still contribute more in the early game thanks to the fact that he has the option of using javelins, in particular against the boss of chapter 1 who is locked to 1 range. Now javelin hit rates are god awful, so it's not the best option, but it's one that Abel has that Kane lacks. Thankfully, when we enter FE12, the turns have tabled, and Kane is now the better Cavalier, mostly because he joins earlier. The logic that I used in FE3 Book 2 applies here once again. It is worth noting that FE12 is probably the game that I have the least experience and knowledge of, so if there is some niche that Abel has that I'm just missing entirely, please let me know, FE12 heads. But otherwise, I'm gonna go ahead and award Kane the win. The Red Cavalier wins keep going, because when we enter Awakening, Sully vs. Stahl is one of the more lopsided matchups I've ever seen, which is kind of funny, because on a glance, they're not too far apart from each other. But every single one of the little edges are in Sully's favor. She joins one chapter earlier than Stahl, so there's extra availability. Her stats are just better enough than him that on lunatic mode she can avoid getting one-rounded by some enemies that would one-round him. And her weapon rank of choice is Lances. She doesn't have D rank, but she's closer to E, and because of discipline she functionally has D rank, meaning that she gets access to javelins sooner than he does. Because of how threatening lunatic plus awakening enemies are, being able to attack them without retaliation is a huge boon. Last but not least, Sully's gender is also an advantage in the early game because it means that she has support options with Krom, Frederick, Virion, Vake, and Kellum, 
allowing her to either function as a backpack or get them as a backpack depending on which you prefer. Stahl, on the other hand, as a male, has mostly magical support options available, which doesn't really help him out too much because he's a physical unit. It's kind of hilarious just how much is working against Stahl. I mean, in his support conversations with Muriel, the reason that they bond is that she wants to study him because of how fucking mediocre he is. I'm just saying, the number of deployment slots goes down by one in the transition from chapter 2 to chapter 3, meaning that if you kill this guy off, there is nothing lost other than a bronze sword. Fire Emblem Fates ditched Christmas Cavaliers in favor of Christmas Ninjas, which is a much cooler concept. I like to picture them throwing shurikens made of candy cane. Saizo is unavailable in Conquest, so instead I will judge them based on their revelations and birthright performances. Saizo is the better unit in Birthright by a significant margin, and he is one of the best hard carries, typically thought of as the third best unit right after Ryoma and Korin. It's not really a competition here. In Revelations, they are much closer, but I do think Kaze comes out on top here. He joins earlier amongst the Scrub Squad of the Wind Tribe, however, he is one of the few units worth training at that point. I would argue he is really the only unit worth training on his join map. Since Rinka, Hana, and Tsubaki are all pretty bad, and then Gunter, your servant, and Corin should all be overleveled by this point. Funneling all of that experience into him can allow him to function as a partial carry for you, at least until your army gets flooded by royals, at which point you phase him out for the stronger units. Upon returning to Valentia, we see that there have been some design overhauls, most notably for Lucas and Forsyth who are now red and green armors, and therefore I would count as the Christmas Armor Knights. Lucas is the clear winner here. Because he joins earlier, he's probably going to promote sooner, and he will stay ahead of Forsyth in the level curve unless you specifically go out of your way to grind Forsyth. The Forsyth to be reckoned with is definitely a funny meme, but he's not really anything more than that. On Celica's side, we have the Christmas Mages, May and Bowie. Now previously, I didn't consider them to fall into the archetype. After all, Mei has pink hair and Bowie has grey hair. However, someone pointed out to me that Mei has red clothing on and Bowie has green clothing on. And honestly, I need a free win for the red cap team, so we're counting it. This is pretty definitively going to be in Mei's favor. She has better stats than Bowie, to the point where she doubles enemies that he doesn't, she has access to Thunder at base, and upon promotion, she'll get access to swords in order to counter without needing to take damage. The only slight advantage that he has over her is his ability to promote at a lower level, but he gets less out of promotion than she does, so she probably deserves the experience more than him. And speaking of red girls dunking on green boys, Fromm is pretty clearly better than Klon. As much as I love the Pickle Mage, he is pretty strictly outclassed by most other mages in the game. Fromm, on the other hand, has a legitimate niche. Access to B-rank staffs without a seal means that she can use Warp, Rescue, and Rewarp at their full capacity, since magic doesn't affect staff range. Additionally, because she's one of only three units with arts access before you get Byleth, she has the Chi Adept bonuses almost to herself. This means if you want to do a fun Lucina Ball with the Chi Adept bonus for 100% Bondage Shield, she is one of the best centers. As a side note, I low-key love how the Christmas Cavaliers have slowly drifted to different classes, and now we get the Christmas Stewards who don't even share a class with each other. The fast calf, strong calf thing got pretty repetitive pretty quickly, so I'm glad that they're trying to spice it up, and I'm excited to see how the Cain and Abel archetype evolves going into further entries. Now, with all of that out of the way, let's take our final tally and find out who's been naughty and who's been nice. Because of the limitations of Tear Maker, I used Project Ember sprites to represent Cain and Abel from FE3 Book 1, and I used Kaze and Saiso's kids to represent them in Revelations. However, the final toll is 8 points for the Green Cavalier, and 10 points for the Red Cavalier. Let's fucking go! Let's fucking go! Red Cav Supremacy! Red Cav Supremacy! I didn't even need to cheat and include Tearing Saga, where the Red Cavalier Kreis is just leagues better than the worthless Green Cavalier Arcus. Thank you everyone for watching, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you celebrate Christmas, I hope you have a Merry Christmas, and if you don't, I hope you have a wonderful day. But most importantly, I hope you take away from this that I have scientifically proven Red Cavs are better than Green Cavs, and always will be, so, uh, suck it Green Cavs.
At this time of year, it's always good to reflect on what we're thankful for, and I'm thankful for the support of all of my patrons, including the pre-promotes Jamie Collins, Marin Karen, Thick Molder, George Grenville the 7th PM, Danielle Kalaskas, Anya, Tailored Muffin, Dr. Majalis, Herc, SUP, Gabe the Green, and Control Alt Aegis. If you are interested in supporting the channel financially, there is a link to the Patreon below, and it comes with a number of really cool benefits. But if you don't have the means to do so, please don't stretch yourself financially. I don't want anyone going broke over Fire Emblem videos. It is just as helpful to click like and subscribe. That supports me as well. Take care, stay warm, and uh, stay safe, gamers.